obviously, we all know what we're talking about tonight, right? And if it's not obvious, I'm about to make it very Maybe. obvious for you. Jesus. Love? Sex! Oh, wow. We are talking about sex, right? Yes. Here's the fun thing. This is normally one of the words you hear in church, and it's like, sex? Shh, don't talk about it. We're not going to talk about it. Guess what? We're not going to do that today. We're going to talk about it. Because it's something that needs to be talked about. See, when it comes to sex, there are a lot of things. Um, one of the things, honestly, for me that I can say that I know when it comes to sex is that God designed it to be something beautiful, amazing, and basically like a phenomenal experience. However, we live in a society that sits there and says sex is more than basically what you bargain for. But don't worry, because it doesn't matter what you trade. As long as you get it, it's okay. See, a lot of the times, when it comes to uh, basically describing sex and looking at it, uh, in the Bible, we see it a lot of times where it, it kind of brings it up, right? I know this is one thing, if you look at this and you read it, uh, the word sex isn't only said once, and you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, that, that was easy, like, well, job well done. Uh, it talks about it a lot. And see, one of the things that I think is crazy is when we talk about sex, and we're kind of really looking at it in the Bible, it's almost to the point to where, well, where can we talk about sex that's kind of almost relevant today, but isn't all the way back over there, like we're reading the book of Leviticus and kind of like just going through some crazy things. And we're like, I don't get it. And so going over it, when we were talking about like this sermon series, what we want to do, one of the scriptures we came to, we we're looking at is in Corinthians. And see, Corinthians, Paul has a lot to say about sex, especially in 1 Corinthians and in 2. But when I was just trying to sit down and pray and just like, all right, God, like where, where are we going to start with this? I just felt almost kind of to give you guys like the mentality of what was going on, kind of what, what's the generalization of what's happening back then. So here's the thing. Basically, there's three words in the New Testament. This one actually is nowhere in the Bible, but this is what the Greeks would use. That's kind of describing love. So eros is a romantic love or sexual love. Philos is basically brotherly friendship or companionship love. And then you have agape. And this one, in my opinion, is the one, like, you definitely, like, what I'm say. This one's brought up 55 times in the New Testament. This one, I think, is brought up, like, 232. It's basically mentioned a lot, like, a lot, a lot. But the point is, it's a love with the concern of the well-being of the other person, basically, and like I was saying, the love that is most used in the New Testament for God or Christ's love. Basically, when you see it and you hear it, like, when you hear it a lot of times, like, what is God? God is agape. Like, this is his love. Because really, when it comes to God's love, he sits down and he's concerned about us. He's not just a God who's kind of like, oh, well, it's all about me and forget you. Like, I'm done with you. So here's the thing that's going on this time that I think is really, really crazy and kind of insane. Uh, almost like today, the world is kind of overran with Eros. And when I say that, and it's kind of like, oh, it's like people were just sleeping together, right? It's not the only thing that's going on. See, when it gets to the next slide, sorry. That's like, that's chewing too, that's so weird. Okay, point being, we're gonna have fun. Uh, with this, what we're kind of looking at right now is, is again, when it comes to arrows, back then, I wanna ask like, what is society today versus society then? Because obviously I can say, yeah, it was just sex, but kind of the levels of which sex was going on was kind of a little insane in my honest opinion. Why is it doing two time? All right, so we're gonna have fun with this. <laughs> so, here's the thing, back then, when it came to sex, prostitution was legal and encouraged, right? So like, you know here, basically you hear someone's a prostitute, they get arrested, the cops come and arrest them. They're, it's basically someone who sells their body for sex. This is something that was encouraged back then. Example, when you had a family, you would get married. But once you get married, you'd have someone who basically, say you had a son, uh, basically they're kind of the important one, so I'm gonna say that, I'm sorry girls, it's nothing against you, I promise, but this is how they did back then. So if I had a son, I had an heir basically to what I owned. Right? And so here's the thing. If I continue to sleep with my wife and I have more sons, then my inheritance, basically what I'm supposed to give them, is now divvied up amongst a set of one, let's say five. So back then it was a common thing. Instead of me going and sleeping with my wife, like, you know, what you're supposed to do, I would go sleep with a prostitute. Right? And this is, this is their normal. This is where it gets even better. Here's the thing. Back then, too, as you all know, slavery was a thing. It's a lot of it's mentioned in here. And, uh, Basically, <laughs> this is what sucks. Sleeping with slaves, men, women, and children, yes, children, including little boys and little girls. This is something that was common. This was allowed as long as they were your slaves. So like example, say I have my slaves over here. Basically, I can sleep with them and do whatever I want as long as they're mine. 
But say, example, Noah was my other friend. I couldn't do anything to his slaves, and he couldn't do anything to mine. We'd basically have to sell them to one another and to do something. But this, again, this is legal. Remember, this is sex. This is kind of what's going on. And then the last thing is there are places of worship. And this one's huge. Like, worship of the gods, like Aphrodite. Technically, she's the god of, like, fertility and sex when it comes to the Romans and Greeks. But I think she has another name, actually, in Greek. Or no, Roman. But, uh, Venus. Venus. Thank you. But with that... Basically, having sex of any stature, like any stature, was like a go. So, example, if you want to worship Aphrodite, you go to the temple of hers, and basically, you go and you get it on with whoever. And this is you worshiping Aphrodite, right? So, kind of just just to give you a basis, this is uh, and this is like a minor generalization of what's going on back then. But this is literally what is happening in Corinth when Paul is addressing them in this letter. It's something that's there. And the thing is, too, when it comes to the church, the church is partaking in said things. What's going on, right? So we're kind of seeing this. We're looking at it back then. It's like, man, that's kind of intense. Because, like, even now today, there's things that go on. But um, at least they're kind of illegal, right? So we're going to kind of look at some things. That's, you know, what happens today, right? So back then to today. There we go. So today, what do we have? Prostitution. It is illegal in some states in the USA but not in the rest of the world. Literally, I can go fly over to, uh, let's say, Germany, and I can go to a brothel and pay for it, and it's totally cool. It's legal there. Uh, no harm, no foul. Uh, <laughs> sex slaves are illegal. That's true. That's not, we, we frown upon that in society. But the underground sex trade is at an all-time high. Literally, uh, children being stolen, I think it's like almost over 130,000 a year kids are stolen abducted and put basically into sex trafficking or sex slavery to where they're sold to do that. Um, it's crazy, like, I actually believe not the World Cup, when that goes on, it's the highest time of sex trafficking when that occurs. Really sucks. So, that's still there, you know, kind of not, we, as much as we want to sweep it under the rug, it's, it's very much there. It's definitely here in the United States. I actually just had a man today, I was at the post office getting my daughter's, um, basically her passport. We're going to go try to go to Switzerland. But he came up to me and told me that uh, my daughter reminded me of his, and I was thinking, oh, what a sweet sentiment thing. And then he said she went missing since she was seven, and he hasn't seen her since. And that was like, <sighs> like heart broke. I was like, totally not the direction I thought that conversation was going. And he told me to hold on to my daughter and hold on to her tight. And I guarantee you, it's probably what I'm going to do. I'll duct tape it to me. It'll be great. So um, with that, it's something that's there, and it's still active and going on today, even to people here in Lomita. Here's the other thing. I'm gonna say it. Sex gods, they're not really around as much, right? Totally not. But the porn industry, however, is. And just so you guys see it there, I stated down there, but pretty much for the porn industry right now, again, this is basically using sex to sell. Uh, it literally makes over $10 billion a year and is accessible to anyone. The sad thing is I can go grab my smartphone and bring up porn right now. Anyone can do it. You can do it from computers, phones, uh, you go get magazines, DVDs, everything, it's everywhere. And I'd almost have to, if I did have to compare porn, I would say this is basically our act in worship of sex today. It's kind of one of those things, in my opinion, um, it's, it's weird. It's like, <laughs> men and civilization have come so far, but the one thing we can't control is basically our sexual urges and our desires. And uh, it's like, they live that fantasy out through porn. And it's kind of like a caveman in a tux is still a caveman, you know? It's not fixed, it's not safe, and it's there, and it's, it's huge. And again, to reiterate, did I at least, like, did I at least mention prostitution's illegal, right? So it's, it's kind of okay. So this is sex. This is what we're dealing with today. In a society where literally most of this, and literally anything that goes on in this, like, this is okay, <clears throat> this is still kind of okay, bad, but basically, since it's surviving and thriving, people still think it's okay, when really it's not. This is kind of where we're at. I don't want to say we're too far off from the times in court, but we're pretty close. I want to say almost, almost we're getting neck and neck with them. And, um, I'm sorry, I need water right now. But, when we're being neck and neck with them, there's something I want to ask you guys. And it's the bigger thing. It's what's the difference, right? So kind of what's the difference when it comes to sex? What's the difference when it comes to today, kind of us, where we are in sex? Like I said, we're, we're kind of more civilized now, not really, in my honest opinion, nowhere near it. Um, can we save questions actually oh, for answers? I thought this was a question. That's okay, answer. if you want to answer it, 
We'll go for it. Answer. <laughs> I was gonna say. Okay. Sorry, Timmy. It's okay. I put you on blast. Mm -hmm. I apologize. But um, it's one of the things where what's the difference, right? And see, I kind of think it's crazy because a lot of times, especially when it comes to Christian and uh, just Christianity as a whole, we always can say, no, no, sex is bad. Like, no, no, don't go and do this. But I think Scripture has a lot more to say to that. And see, when Paul is addressing basically things pretty similar to what's going on right now in this, he has some pretty stern things to say. And things, in my opinion, I actually agree with a lot. So we're going to hop over real quick if you have your Bibles. Over to 1 first, well, first Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. And we're going to read this. And then we're going to really dive into sex. So. You guys there? Oh, if you guys want to go grab Bibles, you can too. So they're in the back right now. If you want to. If not, it's okay. Whatever you're feeling, I won't stop you. So, this one's called Flee from Sexual Immorality. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but the Lord and the Lord for the body, and God raised the Lord and will also raise up by his power. Do you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you know, or do you not know that he he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? I love that part because basically it's Paul being sarcastic. For it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but, sexual, but a sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. See, that's just kind of him like starting, getting the nail on the head there, when we're talking about sex, and it's coming to this. And see, um, when it comes to talking about sex, I'm going to be honest, guys, uh, there's really, um, there's like, I'm going to say, like, there's no 15-minute talk we can cam up, like, have up over here and just prepare anyone for the complexity of sexuality. See, uh, there's, there's something about sex that's just so different. There's something about it that Scripture says that's basically so, I don't, I'm not trying to say it's remarkable, but it's on such a different level that not only does Paul kind of go out of his way here to say, like, hey, look, you know what, like, it's just a sin. He sits there and says, hey, look, guess what, like, it's not just a sin, it is you sinning against yourself. How crazy is that? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest things in a lot of times, especially now, is when we live in a society, it doesn't sit there and say, hey, guess what, like, it's bad for you. It says embrace it. it here's the thing, how many of you guys heard the phrase, sex sells? Mm -hmm. Right? It's crazy. I think almost all of you in here have, uh, you can share it, you can see just and not even porn, but just erotica images. You can go to the grocery aisles of stores, and it's top 10 ways of blah, 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 or how to dress this way to feel sexier or be sexier, and X, Y, and Z. And there's all these things that are out there that are just shoved in our faces, basically saying, hey, this is okay. But see, a lot of times when I talk to people, when it comes to like, I've had people come to me like, hey, like I had sex with my girlfriend, I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z. What do you want to talk about? There's something I always ask, and I think it's true that we need to ask this question. And it's one of the things, too, where, like, example, society downplays sex. But this is the thing. When you have to sit back and ask, I say, hey, look, does sex complicate or make your relationships easier? I don't know about you guys, but when I was looking at, like, at pornography as a kid, straight up, I wasn't trying to tell my parents I was doing it. Mm -hmm. I was trying to hide whenever I could. When I was sleeping with my girlfriend, guess what? I wasn't trying to tell my parents, like, oh, guys, what me and her just went and did, mom and dad. It's great. I was totally trying to stay away from it, and I can tell you right now, it complicated the hell out of my relationship, not just with my parents, but with my friends, with my family, and with the person I was doing it with. And it's crazy because we sit back and think, no, it's, it's really not that it's just this. And see, we get the idea of it's just this because society tries to take sex and make it what? It makes it just something physical, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, you go and dance with someone, just like sex. It's just physical. No big deal. This is what we're dealing with. And here's the thing. 
and this is the biggest thing that scripture is hitting on right now, it's that it isn't just physical. Sex is nowhere near just a physical thing. It's crazy because in the society we live in today, example, you look at the porn industry, it's one of those places that say, hey, look, guess what, with sex, like, you can do whatever you want. It's okay, like, we have every form, shape, way you can think of to fantasize about sex because this is what all sex is, like, you know, it's all, it's all just something you want. And the reality is it's not. The reality is God sits there and says, look, like, sex isn't just sex, like, you are sinning against yourself. Like, you are deliberately going out of your way to harm you. And it drives me crazy because the fact that it's just not physical, it's because for you guys. I want to ask you a question right now. This one is an answer question, Timmy. For you guys, if you're ever describing yourself, do you kind of almost, I don't want to say the third person like Tommy says, Tommy does this. But if someone asks you, it's like, oh, well, this is what I do. Like, this is, if I were to ask you, like, hey, what makes Haley Bar Haley? You know, if I were to ask that for any of you, how, how would you say that? In a way, what would you say? You'd say, well, this makes me me because of what? Right? You give a reason. And see, here's the thing, the fact that sex isn't just physical, and that's because there's more to sex because there's more to you. There's a huge thing about you guys, and you guys don't know this yet, and maybe some of you do. I don't want to say, like, everyone raise your hands if you had sex. Like, that's just awkward. I'm not going to do that to you. But here's the thing. To each and every one of you, you were created in God's image. Right? He knitted you together in the womb. He knew what he was doing. There's no two Haley Bars. There's no two Kylie's. It's just basically you are you. And the beauty of God is when he sits there and he designs it this way, and he says, look, this is what I made about you. This is what makes you unique. Society says, guess what? That doesn't matter. It, it's irrelevant. Because here's the thing. Honestly, pretty much you can be sexually compatible with anyone. Straight up. You can have it be a guy. You can have it be a girl. Um, uh, anime pillow. I don't know what's out there. Weird, weird things that are out there. I'm just saying. I've seen some weird stuff. But there's these things out there that basically you pursue. And people do. And it's just like, what the heck? And I'm not saying that because trying to be funny or cute or like, ha ha. But here's the thing, that's their sexuality. And it doesn't matter because basically if you can get sex out of it or they can get sex out of you, that's all it is. And the biggest lie we can buy is basically sitting there and saying that. And see, when it comes to that and saying sex is just a physical thing, I have some questions. I'm not going to lie. These questions are maybe a little bit tougher. Uh, you might be shocked that I'm asking them to you all. And I mean it kindly not to be... But I, it's, it's honestly, when people say sex is physical, these, these are a lot of my responses. So one of the questions I like to ask is, um, so why does child sexual abuse have so much power later in life? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? If a kid has gone and like physically hit, um, no big deal. But if a child is raped, yeah. mm -hmm. what happens? See, I knew a man actually. Unfortunately, he, he passed away. I was at his funeral on Valentine's Day. It was a bummer. But he was sexually abused by someone when he was a child. And it's crazy because his whole life, therefore, after, one of the things he struggled with, the biggest thing he struggled with was with pornography. Mm -hmm. He was married. He had kids. Um, great guy. His wife didn't divorce him by the grace of God. But it's something he always fought with. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because when it came to the last years of his life, he sat there and he was just talking to one of his friends like, man, I can't just quit this and I don't know why. Like, I've been fighting it for so long. And his friend asked him, were you molested as a child? And he was actually, well, yeah, you know what I was? I was I was three, four years old when it happened. I remember, I know the guy. Like, I can call up right now. And the guy said, you need to forgive this person for molesting you. And he was just kind of like, come again? And he's like, yeah, you need to forgive this person for molesting you. Just do it. So straight up, he went, he called. I'm pretty sure it was a very awkward phone conversation. <laughs> like, hey, I forgive you for doing this to me when I was a kid. Um, but point being, after that happened, and I think this is crazy thing too, it's part of his testimony and I love it, is once he went and he forgave that, and he was able to kind of let go, that sexual abuse, like that addiction to pornography ended. Mm -hmm. I think that's insane. And here's the thing though, a lot of that stirred from what? Something that happened when he was a kid. So again, if sex is just physical, this should be all right. Why is it, <laughs> why is rape so much more devastating to a person than being mugged or beaten up? Here's the thing girls, I, I can straight up say this. I, I think all the women in here, probably been to, you're terrified of being raped. Mm -hmm. For good reasons. And here's the thing. If sex is just physical, you know, like getting beaten up, if you get raped, no big deal, right? 
Like you, you shouldn't have traumatic experience. Like you should just go file a claim in court, get it settled, and time's gonna heal it, right? You're gonna be good, right? It's just physical, but it's not. It's totally not. And so here's the thing: because it's not, because it's so detrimental, <laughs> it's like we can't overlook it. And the last thing. I, I will admit I was stating it, but right there it's saying, why is it easy for the person to report salt and not rape? And I think for a lot of people, example, um, even for me as a kid, I was, I, was, I was skiing in a park one day, me and my cousin ran off the bushes because we had to go to the bathroom. Some dude basically walked in the bushes and started doing something he shouldn't have been doing in front of a bunch of kids. Uh, we were all weirded out, so we skated away. I'm like, what's that guy's problem? Didn't think anything of it. Didn't think, hey, this is what I was exposed to at the age of like 10. Mm -hmm. And luckily, thank God, nothing happened. But straight up, I never told my parents about that until probably I was like 20, I want to say 23, 24. Mm. And luckily my brother said something when he was younger, because obviously he was smarter. <laughs> it's like kind of, but it's one of those things to where it happens. And even when something didn't happen to us by the grace of God, like I still didn't say it until how many years later? Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because we struggle with all these things. And see, when it comes to sexuality, and when it comes to basically sex just being physical, Another question I have to ask, and I think this is kind of key and detrimental for everyone, is basically, and this, is a, this gets a little personal too, I'm sorry, why are you so curious about the sexual history of the last person you dated? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you guys, but straight up, like I know for me, oh. uh, I was a moron, and I did a lot of things I wish I didn't, and when it came time to meet my wife, and I met her, and I know she's my wife at the time, but I was pretty sure, I was like, I'm gonna bag this one. But um, basically, when it came to that conversation and it got brought up, I, I had a lot harder of a time mm -hmm. saying, hey, look, my bad. Didn't really feel like waiting at all. So, sorry. You know, I love you by the grace of God, people forgive. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of it. But see, here's the thing. When it comes to these questions, I'm not asking them to be like, come on, checkmate, like I proved you wrong. I'm saying it because it's true. Because God designed sex to be something deeper, something way more than what we normally like anticipate or hope for. Uh, it's it's on a whole unique level. Me and Dave were talking about it earlier. Even they, like there's a whole scientific chemistry that goes behind it. If you want to know more, I highly recommend talking to him. He will educate you there fully. But when it comes to sex, there's something that's so much more about it. And see, it's crazy because this is the I word. I like, I like to call it that. But basically, do you guys want to take a guess what the I word is? No, it's not for iPad or iPod or i something. Basically, what's the word? Yeah. Ah, there you go. Did you look at the slides? No, no, no. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> the I word. The I word is intimacy. See, here's the thing. We have a God who designed us to be intimate. We have a God who has an intimate relationship with us. And here's the biggest thing. When it comes to sex and what we're dealing with today, if you look at the media, straight up, if you're gonna go watch a sitcom. What do people do? Do they first like go on a date, maybe wine and dine, they propose, they get married, and then they go and have sex? Straight up, no. That's like, if you don't believe me, go watch Friends. Totally not that. But we sit back and we're told that intimacy doesn't matter. If you want to be intimate, it's irrelevant, you're being pointless. Just, that's not a part of sex. But that's not what God designed it to be and see a lot of the times when we sit back and we think about intimacy, we're sitting there and we're looking, and this is what I'm gonna tell you all now, while we're not really looking for it outwardly, inwardly we're longing for it. Mm -hmm. I think everyone wants to be intimate. I think everyone wants to know they can have that relationship and connection with that one person. And a lot of times what happens is when we're searching for intimacy, and we're sitting there and saying, look, this is really what I wanna be, like what I'm looking for, God, what I'm hoping for, is we sit back and we kind of jump on the first chance we get, because whoever we meet, this has to be Mr. or Mrs. Right. You know, it's gonna be a good thing, so obviously this is gonna have to work. So you go, you love them, but then society says if you really love them, you have sex with them, right? Because obviously if you don't have sex, you're just holding out, like you're, you're being a jerk. Like why would you do that to the person? Mm -hmm. And it's not the case, you go and you sleep with them, and then what happens? Oh no, you go further down the road, and guess what? Mr. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Right, is it Mr. and Mrs. Right? You start thinking, man, like we were saying earlier, everyone's basically compatible sexually. That's not a problem. But you start realizing these things like, I really don't have a relationship with this person. Like, we're just kind of 
good at sex, maybe, where we're good at sex with each other, and then the standard of your relationships start becoming that. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what society portrays it is. If you're having good sex with them, then it's a good relationship. But, you know, if you guys can't go agree on somewhere to eat for lunch, then, like, obviously, you know, it's, it's horrible and you're going to go to hell for it. I don't know. But the thing is, intimacy is lost. And see, it's crazy. Because this mindset that we're being pitched and portrayed, it's, like, completely and blindly obvious. And it drives me crazy because we, uh, a lot of times we, we think it's not. And see, it reminds me of a story. It's a very simple story. I don't know if you guys heard this one. Sorry for this next slide, but it's okay. But have you guys ever heard of the story? Oh, the yeah. Emperor's New Clothes. Mm -hmm. Right? Today we're living in a very Emperor's New Clothes moment. And what I'm saying that, the whole story is this is an Emperor. He wanted to be very fashionable. They couldn't find anything fashionable for him. So basically he got naked and all his advice said, Oh my gosh, these clothes you're wearing, they're so great. They're the best thing ever. Let's parade you around the streets. It's going to be awesome. And it's funny because he's walking around and basically because society and social stature sees him walking in the nude and sit there and go, oh, like, he's kind of a, no, no, no. All the higher-ups are saying, what? Look at this beautiful outfit he's wearing. So what do they start doing? Oh, look at this beautiful outfit. It's so great. I love it. It makes sense, right? And then it's funny because he's parading around. He's doing his thing. A little, little kid runs up to him. And he's just straight up like, hey, why is this dude naked? Yeah. You know? And then people are like, wait, what do you mean? Like, and they're like, well, is he? Yeah, he is naked. What do you mean? And then slowly but surely, people start noticing, hey, the king is naked. And the king starts hearing this. But instead of the king going back and saying, oh, look, you know what? Like, yeah, I need to put some clothes on. He starts, like, putting his clothes down. Like, well, I'm still going to march this out. <laughs> right? And then by the end of it, the king is being laughed at by everyone. And see, so, guys, there's something marching around right now. That's just totally like the most idiotic thing that I can't think of. Actually, I can think of it a lot. But it's the fact and the idea that basically sex isn't intimate. Sex is just an instant gratification. And it's crazy because here's the thing. People who have slept with people and have broken up know this. See, there's a thing that happens after you sleep with someone. When you basically, if you don't stay together, the whole thing in Genesis well, that's being quoted by Paul there is the two become one flesh. Jesus reiterates it in Matthew, Mark, and a few other chapters. But he sits down and says, hey, look, you become this when you have it. That's why Paul's talking about, hey, you husbands who are going and sleeping with prostitutes, like, don't you know you're becoming one flesh with this person? You are basically enacting an act of marriage with them. Like, that's what sex does. It forms this intimate bond. But instead, <laughs> we're told that it's not that. And we're stuck, it's okay. And we're stuck marching around trying to believe this stupid idea. And see, here's the thing. I feel like even for my generation, like it's it's lost. Like this this war, we can keep fighting it, but it's gonna be hard to beat. But when it comes to you guys, when it comes to people who are younger, for you to step up and say, look, you know, yeah, we're not gonna see that lie. We're gonna we're basically gonna call it out and say, this is what it is, it's a fraud, it's fake. That gives you guys an edge. That gives you guys an advantage that's like, I wish I had so much more. Because in my mindset, when I was younger, basically, like, sex was the thing. Like, if you're having sex with a girl, your relationship's great. Keep it up. And I wish, I wish I had known better. Even going to church and just figuring things out, I wish I had known sooner what I know now than what I did when I was younger. And it's the fact that basically sex isn't intimacy. It's, it's the whole fact that when you take it within the context of what God is and you put it with him, that's what makes it intimate. That's what puts the reinforcement behind it. That's when we take it and twist it into something to what it is now where we lose that. And see, it's crazy because a lot of times in church we hear this phrase called sexual purity, right? How many of you ever heard that? I know everyone there has. There's a whole movement about it. It's great. But here's the thing. I feel a lot of times when we try to strive for sexual purity, in a way, just the way we are in the society we live in, we're setting ourselves up for a goal to fail. Because here's the thing. There's only one person in the history of the world that I know who's sexually pure. His name was Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, <laughs> I'm not saying it's an excuse to do it either. I think we're going to have a lot harder of a time, right? But here's the thing. If we sit back and we actually try to practice this idea of, like, what does it mean to be sexually pure? What does it mean to, like, abstain from doing these things? What's crazy is basically it helps pave a pathway for intimacy later. And the thing I love about that, just this idea, 
is the fact of for you guys being able to go to your future spouse and be like, hey, look, you know what, like, this intimacy, like, I was saving it for you. You know what, interesting, I'm not going to say if you guys have done something, like, guess what, too bad, God doesn't forgive you if that's that. God does forgive you. It's okay. But a lot of the times, when we sit back and we're like, oh, like, what's going to happen now? Like, I've done this. I can tell you guys I should have. I have done this. I am guilty standing in front of you, talking to you about it. But here's the thing, and this is the beauty of God, is that forgiveness and consequences are two different things, right? I've been forgiven. God forgives you. If you go and have sex before marriage, God will forgive you. I'm not saying go and do it either. That's stupid. But I'm telling you now, he will forgive you. We fall short. But the consequences of sex, just the dealing with it, it's like, man, I, I can tell you guys now, it's like, there's a band I listen to and it's a phrase I stick to, but like sex, it feels so good, but it takes away your youth. You don't know what you're doing because mm. you just subscribe to it and you think this is fun. And I wish, like I was telling you guys, I wish, I wish, I wish I could go back and hit younger Tommy with a mouth on the head about this stuff and tell him the regret you're going to feel later, the things you're going to have to go through, straight up, I'm going get to um, get a very serious moment, you guys, right now. See, when I got married, after me and my wife, obviously we did marry things, right? Sex. In that, one of the right, right? Ew, ew, ew. My daughter just magically appeared by the story. <laughs> and, um, yeah, right? But, but so, we did that. And um, there was one time where, uh, yeah, ha ha. But uh, there's, there's one time where after we were having adult fun, we sat there and we were talking. And I made a joke, right? And it was just a joke about one of my past relationships. No big deal to me. I was just thinking like, ha ha, like it's funny, it's fine. And my wife started crying, right? And for me, what sucks is I was like, what did I say? It's a joke. Am I really not that funny? Like, you didn't tell me. <laughs> but my wife said, no, I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset, but it just hurts knowing this. And I was like, Tommy sucks again. <laughs> It's true, but guys, the level and the affection of what sex does to you, what it can do to your future relationships, that intimacy, it can damage it, and you don't even know. You have no idea. For me, I've, I've heard about it, and I never thought anything of it. And then in that moment, I realized everything, everything about it's real. It's not a joke. It's not just, hey, you don't do this, it's bad, God forgives you, you're good. It's something so much more. And so here's the problem. Once we have sex, my wife, like I said, God bless her heart, she was a much better person than I was. But in that, for me, I got to a point so much more to where my heart had hardened to the idea of sex. Mm -hmm. I basically, here's the thing. Like I was saying, you have sex with someone, you split up, it hurts. It hurts a ton. And here's the thing. Instead of saying, hey, I'm going to cope with this pain and I'm going to face it and I'm going to deal with it, you kind of shut yourself off from it. I don't know about you guys, who's ever been in a relationship before, and this is back in the day, I don't do my gender when Facebook was cool. It's like, you're in a relationship, relationship ends, you delete everything off of Facebook. Oh, yeah. Or maybe now Instagram. And it's like, you're with that one person, there's no trace whatsoever. No one will know, no one must know. You get rid of it, right? And it's because we sit back and we harden our hearts and we say, you know what, I'm not gonna deal with this. And then here's the thing, the first cut hurts the worst, but then after you go back to it again, again and again, you just keep hardening yourself even more, because you don't want to experience that pain. And here's the thing, <laughs> it's like I'm saying this right now, each time we have sex outside of marriage, that's what we're doing. We're basically building up this barrier. So when that time comes, and it comes to get married, you're like, hey, yeah, I'm going to do this, it's going to be cool. Here's the thing, um, putting on a dress or a tux and saying yes and paying the band to play and everything, after they go home, guess what? This situation is it doesn't go away. It carries with you over to this. And not to say, like, look, now you have baggage. <laughs> Guess what? You got baggage, whether you want it or not. And you have to be willing to deal with it. And the, one of the easiest ways, in my opinion, that we can deal with it is by sitting there and addressing it. And I'm telling you guys now, like, I've had friends destroyed over relationships. Like, have you guys ever had those friends where like, you shouldn't be in a relationship with that person, but they do it anyway, and you don't want to say anything about it? Anyone? One, just me. That happened to one of my brothers actually. And um, a divorce and crazy stuff later, it was like he's destroyed and now he, 
he can't even be in California. He, he literally lives all the way in Florida now because he doesn't want to be around here and remember the things that happened. And like, how hard is it to listen to this? And I get it, sexual temptation isn't like, oh, hey, like flee. I know I told myself the first time I was exposed to it that I was gonna flee. I definitely didn't flee. I did a horrible job of fleeing. I stayed. Um, but when it comes to it, it's like, how do we handle it? And so here's the thing, and this is the biggest thing too. We have a God who loves us, right? We have a God who talks about this for a reason. He doesn't ignore it and sit there and say, well, I made sex obviously for this person, so go ahead and do it. He sits there and says, no, this is what I've called you to do when it comes to sex. This is what I'm asking you to follow through on. And here's the biggest thing. It's like, I want to ask you this. If God is a heavenly father that loves you and he wants the best for you, what would you expect him to say about it? Right? God designed sex. He made it. Do you really think he's going to be like, mm, I don't really know what's going to happen if you do this. Maybe you should try. <laughs> no. He doesn't. He sits back and says, look, I made this for this design. Like, you two will become one flesh. You will share this intimate moment, this passion, this flair that's there. And it's something that you need to hold on to, grasp, and keep it tight. Because here's the thing. I can just write in the sermon. I thought about putting in all of the statistics and stuff I brought up. But just it's crazy how much higher the divorce rate is for people who had sex before marriage than it is with those who abstain from it. And it's like, it blows my mind. But if there's one thing, I know I've talked a lot, this is probably one of my longest sermons I've done with you guys, I'm sorry, because I don't, I don't want to lose you, but luckily we're right there. But if there's one thing I want to just remind you guys when it comes to sex right now, is straight up our society, we're living in a society of arrows, right? It's still there. It hasn't gone away. Basically, the sexual love is the love that's the driving force, I think, pretty much behind everything right now. And being a Christian, in my opinion, is definitely the not cool thing to do. It's definitely the not smart thing to do when it comes to sex. But here's the beauty of God. And here's the beauty of when God talks about sex in Scripture. He's proving a point. And the fact is that God is proving how agape is what we need over eros. He's proving by saying, hey, look, when you're actually concerned about this other person, even though you may not know them right now, when you're still concerned and loving this person who you don't even know, you are preparing yourself for something so much greater. Because here's the thing, like we're talking about sex, what is it? You get sex when you want it. You just dive on in, right? But what does God say? He says, no, you're caring about this other person. You're caring about yourself you're caring about yourself so much that you're caring about them, and in that you are showing them love, and you don't even know it. And I think that's the beautiful thing about God, is he doesn't sit there and say, hey, I want you all to hop into sex right now. It's going to be great. He says, hey, look, like, prepare yourself for this, because we live in a society that definitely doesn't want you to. We live in a society that says intimacy doesn't matter, and we live with it, and it just sits there, and like, guys, it's in your face. I can't stress enough, especially for you guys in high school. It breaks my heart junior high, it's like, I have a daughter. She's going to get older, and guess what? It's like, I can joke around and say, I'm going to buy a shotgun, and it's going to be, I'm going to stop it, but I can't. I can't. And it's going to come for her, too. And it's just, man, man, it drives me crazy. But the beauty is, we have a God who's bigger than that. We have a God who's stronger than it. And we have a God that loves us so much, he's going to say, hey, look, I'm going to provide you a way. I'm going to show you how you can go up against this and how basically you don't have to cave into these pressures. And that's the beauty of God. So I'm gonna pray. And once I'm done praying, you guys don't have to hear me talk anymore, it's okay. But we're gonna go to the small groups. We have about 30 minutes. Uh, if you go longer, it's really cool, but please make the best of them. I know I only have about nine questions, but if you have a question, I forgot to mention that too. Up in the top corner is that number. If you guys have any questions, you can text it, whatever you want. Um, just basically, I won't know. But any questions you have, please feel free to fire away. But with that, just uh, even if the question is not on the sheet, dive into it and ask your leaders. I encourage you. I beg you. Just don't leave any stone unturned. So with that, I'm going to pray. Father God, just thank you for the students right now, Lord. When it comes to sex and just the, the intimate, passionate, great thing you designed, Lord, let us remember how we can keep it as something sacred and holy to you, God. As we can keep it something sacred and holy to our significant others, whoever they might be, wherever they are, 
whether they're here now or not, Lord, just let us know that basically we value them enough and value ourselves not to try to fall short, God, but stand up and say, this is from a God who loves us and he knows what is best for us, so we want to trust you in that. So I thank you for that, God, and I thank you for these students being here, Lord, and just uh, listening to such a fun topic because I know it can get awkward. I know it's not easy to talk about, and I know that um, when we look at it and we look at it through and with you, it's just so much better. So I want to thank you for that. In the name we pray, God. Amen.